2 Timothy chapter 2, let's read the text and then we will break it down this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many, not just a few, many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Lord, we pray what Paul prayed over Timothy. Lord, would you give us understanding in all things? As we open your word this morning, Lord, I just pray for every one of my friends in this room this morning, Lord, the distractions, the things that want to pull our attention away from you, the things that are jockeying for position in our hearts with you, Lord, the, the drama, the junk that's going on outside of this room, Lord, I pray that you would just make it calm, Lord, like you spoke to the sea and you said, peace be still, and the wind and the wave obey you, Lord. I just pray that you would clear our minds this morning so that we would have ears to hear what you want to say to us, that we'd have eyes to see the path that you have for us in life, Lord. And I pray that you would speak to us in a way that is so plain that we understand it and so powerful that we cannot help but change. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, Paul, an apostle starts off as Saul, and we see this, this journey through the book of Acts, and we see through Paul's life. We have so much writing about Paul's life, and I think of Philippians and what Paul used to hold on to. And in Philippians chapter 3, he says, look, if, if, my, if my righteousness was found in the law, I was blameless. I was a Hebrew. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Like, I had it all going on. If I was going to trust in that, I had it all together. But he says, I count all of that as rubbish. All the things of the world, all, all the position, all the entitlement, everything. He says, I count that all as rubbish so that I can gain Jesus Christ. Because he found superior, Jesus Christ is superior over absolutely everything. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's the superiority of Jesus Christ over everything. Over angels, over sacrifices, over man. He's an enduring priesthood. Like he lasts forever and nothing can touch him. He lives to make intercession for us. Like there's all this stuff that we find throughout the Bible about the superiority of of Jesus. And if we could just get a hold of that and understand it, that is what Paul preached. That is what the gospel is, the good news that Jesus came and he defeated death, the very thing that we all have to face. Every one of us will face and none of us can conquer in our own power. Jesus came and put a hole through death and made a way through death so that we could live life abundantly and eternally once we put our faith in Jesus Christ. This is the message that Paul preached. This is the message that not only Paul, but every one of the apostles, except for John, died for. Because it was that important that their life meant nothing compared to the life that this message gives to anyone who not only hears it, but receives it and believes in it. That's radical. And Paul says everything else is loss. Everything else. What does it mean when everything else is lost? I count everything as rubbish. Rubbish means, it's kind of a vulgar word, actually, that Paul uses in Philippians 3, saying that everything else does, it pales in comparison to Jesus Christ. Everything else. That means that there is nothing else that will captivate you or catch your eye, or there's nothing else that this world can provide that will ever come close to comparing to a personal relationship, a personal and powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing that will ever compare. There's going to be a ton of things that will compete. Look, do you remember back in Genesis chapter 2 when Adam is there in the garden and he's alone and there is no woman yet and God looks at him and he's like, this is not good. It was the first time that God said it's not good in the Bible. He says it's not good that man should be alone. And he looks around and there was nothing comparable to Adam. There was no one comparable, nothing comparable to Adam. And so he made Adam a helper who was comparable to him. And you know what that tells me? Is that there's all sorts of things in this world that are going to compete but there's nothing that will ever compare when it comes to marriage. And likewise, with Jesus Christ, there are all sorts of things that are going to compete for our attention and our relationship with Jesus Christ, but there's nothing that will ever compare. It will look enticing. It'll be enticing. That's how you bait animals. That's how you catch animals. You put something that's enticing in a trap, and then you end up taking them out back and popping two behind the ear. And it, ha it happens. 
It happens to people. That's the saddest thing. Satan takes him out back behind the woodshed. Oh. But Paul, who's about to die for this incredible message, he has one thing on his mind, and he wants to articulate something to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. Like, I don't know how many of you have sat around somebody's bedside as they're just about to go be with the Lord, or maybe not go be with the Lord, go be with Satan. And the regrets that pour out, but the, the weight of every single word that they speak before they go home is profound. And so when I come into a book like 2 Timothy, like, I just, I'm in awe of the words because this is a man who, 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 me personally, I admire this man more than just about any man outside of Jesus Christ, right? Like you look at what God did through this man and the wisdom this man possessed and the sacrifices he made and the advancements in the kingdom that were made through the apostle Paul. And in his dying words, he wants to say something. He wants to communicate something. And he's going to say the most important thing, the thing that is most dear to his heart. And he tells Timothy this, he says, you therefore, my son. Now, whenever we see therefore, we have to ask, why is therefore there? What is it there for? It's always pointing back. Paul has articulated some things. He's saying, I want you to stir up the gift. In chapter one, he's saying, I want you to stir up the gift that has been given to you by the laying on of hands. Like you don't need to be timid. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Like God's people, Christians, should be the most powerful people that walk on this planet. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He has not given us a spirit of timidity. Yes, we can be meek, but we can be powerful and we can have a sound mind. And we can love even through the nastiest of situations. It's radical. It's radical. And he walks through and he's telling Timothy, he's like, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of, of how I've committed my life to Jesus because I know if you look here in chapter, verse 12 of chapter 1, he says, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. My labor hasn't been in vain. All the sacrifices I've made, they haven't been in vain. All the times that I chose Jesus over another opportunity hasn't been in vain. I didn't miss out on anything. I gained everything. And so often the world teaches you, if you put your trust in Jesus, if you invest your life in God's kingdom, you're missing out on all the world has to offer. But Paul says, I count it all as rubbish. Nothing compares to Jesus. Nothing compares to a life lived through, for, and to Jesus. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I think oftentimes we think of our different strengths and things that when we look at a person, we're like, oh, they're strong because of this. They can lift 500 pounds. That makes them strong. But the strength that we derive, where we derive our strength from as Christians is we derive our strength from the grace of God, meaning the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And you might ask, why is that strength? What is so strong about the grace of God, having unmerited favor? Well, it's because of this. It's because as we go through life, we can't help it but mess up. That's the reality. We botch things all of the time. And if you're around people enough, you find when people mess up, they just beat themselves up over their mistakes. And it's like, how can I go forward after I did this? How can I go forward after I had to claim bankruptcy? How can I go forward after my wife left me? How can I go forward after my child died? How can I go forward now that I'm paralyzed? How can I go forward now that I lost my business? How can I go forward? And the answer is the strength to do that, the strength to push forward and to keep walking is through the grace of God. Because he says, it doesn't matter what you've done. It matters what you do now. That's the reality. And that is such a liberating message because, because the world would tell you that you are defined by your past. The world would to, to tell you that, that the things, those errors that you made, those mistakes that you made in the past, they're going to hold them over your head until the day you die. And your dad was a horse thief, and so you're a horse thief, and your kids are going to be horse thieves. Like, but the cool thing about God is that he breaks that chain. He breaks those molds, and he takes losers throughout the Bible, and he turns them into legends is what he does. That's radical cool stuff. And that's why he tells Timothy, you got to be strong, but he, he specifies where the strength comes from. The strength comes from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If your faith isn't in Christ Jesus, you don't have the strength that is coming from being in Christ Jesus. 
But we as believers, we're, we're told that, that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God makes all things new. Behold, he makes all things new. We are a new creation. Old things have passed away. They're all gone. Old things, when we come to Jesus, it is a blank slate. And sometimes there's repercussions from what has happened in the world, but we can walk in confidence that God is not condemning us. And so then we can stand boldly. Then we can stand strongly. Then we can declare bravely what God has done in our lives. You know, that was the strength of the testimony of so many people in the Gospels. I think of the Samaritan woman who was with five other guys, and the guy that she was with right then wasn't even her husband. Do you know what she went and told the whole town and why they got saved? She said, I met a man who told me everything that I've done. She capitalized on the junk of her past and said Jesus had overcome it. And you know what everybody did? They're like, yeah, we knew she was promiscuous. We got to go see what this guy's about. And they all go out there and get saved. Sometimes we think of our past, we're scared to share some of the junk that we have done. Guys, we've all done junk, whether we've gotten caught for it or not. It's in our closet, right? And as Christians, we should come out of the closet. Just saying. Too far. Verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many... Is it hot in here or is it just me? We wanted you guys to get a feel for what hell would be like, so welcome. Welcome. If you think this is hot. (laughs) And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses... Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is the call of every Christian. Of course, this is what would be considered a pastoral epistle, right? And so the role, as we see in Ephesians chapter 4, of the pastor in the church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is growing the, the kingdom of God, spreading the gospel, the great commission of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. To go into all the, I, I, I go into all the world and make disciples that is the Great Commission. That is our job, to teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. And he says, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Paul says the way that this is done isn't necessarily through mass evangelism. It's through a man standing there and teaching other people, but not just anybody, teaching faithful people, right doctrine, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and people who are able to teach others also. He says in verse 3 here, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You must endure hardship. There's two ways we could look at this. You must endure hardship, like hardship is coming and you have to go through it. And then you must endure, like everybody's life is depending on it, that you endure through this hardship. Because it is, the message is that important. Because oftentimes we're not killed for our faith, but we become incapacitated. People make fun of us. People bring up our past and they hold it over our head and we're just like, I'm just not even going to share. Or maybe you share the gospel with a friend or a family member and they say, I don't want to hear that crap anymore. And you're like, fine, I'm never going to tell you the gospel again. I'm just going to. We don't endure the hardship. We give up. We lay down. And in the same way as dying, we become even more ineffective for the gospel. Because why? We run into some hardship. And he says, you must endure hardship. Look, if you're going to be a good soldier, if you're going to be somebody who takes the gospel forward, if you're going to be a world changer and a kingdom builder, like if you're going to do those things, you have to endure hardship. And like our generation, like we're just getting progressively softer and softer. And when adversity comes, we're just like, oh. And we're told not to be bold about our stance. Like, oh, you become a bigot when you do that, right? Like all of a sudden you're this racist bigot for being a Christian and you're just like, I just love everybody equally and hate everybody equally. Like I just, the whole package. It's not bigotry to know the truth and to stand for the truth. We must. Look, we must endure. We must endure. How many people, have you ever known anybody that was on fire for the Lord and they're walking with the Lord and and then something comes up, a hardship comes along and they just give up? And they're done. And the rest of their years, they don't allow God to do anything with their life. They say no to every opportunity that God keeps bringing across their bow. And God's like, hey, come on. 
Look, I know that was hard. I know that just about destroyed you. But, but there's, there's this treasure in earth and vessels. And as I, I break it open, this light shines out. And I know you're broken right now, but that is a perfect place to be because now you're no longer hiding the, the light that I've put inside you and it's shining to everybody and they can see through the cracks and they can see how I'm ministering. And that's what it's all about. And I just want to challenge you, if you're up against hardship or if you've just given up and you've become idle in God's kingdom, that it is not over. Look, in Romans chapter 5, it says this, not only do we glory, not only do we glory in this, meaning the, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we have life and life abundantly, we also glory, glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, kind of like endurance. Tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by his Holy Spirit, who he has given to us. That's cool. Look, I know everybody's going through something. We look at other people's lives, and we're like, man, they got it all together. They got, they don't have anything going on in their life, but I look around this room, and I know what's going on in so many people's lives, and then there's more stuff that I don't even know about. The loss, the hurt, the illnesses, the the struggles, the financial struggles, the, the family struggles, husbands and wives not getting along, and, and you just want to cut and run. But Paul would tell you, you must endure. And that's coming from a guy who'd been whipped, stoned, shipwrecked, in prison, <laughs> spending time floating around on wood in the middle of the ocean. Like, that's Paul. He knows what it's like to suffer great loss. In fact, Paul had things in his life that he said, look, I begged the Lord three times to take it from me. But he said, my grace is what? My grace is sufficient. And oftentimes we're looking for an out. We're looking for for the pain to go away and the pressure to go away and the tribulation to go away and the hardship to go away. And God is sitting there, he's saying, no, no, no. You've got to learn this lesson that if you get nothing else out of life, if you have God's grace, you have all the strength you need to endure absolutely anything. Be strong, Paul says, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You therefore must endure. I think of Hebrews Hebrews and chapter 12, the author of Hebrews says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all these other people, so Hebrews chapter 11 is about all these other people who did mighty conquests for the Lord. And not only the ones that everything went good for, the ones that things went terribly bad for. They were destitute, afflicted, sawn in half like Isaiah. The the legend of Isaiah is that they, they, they took him and they sawed him in half with a wooden saw starting in the groin up. And they didn't give in. And those guys should be inspirations to us to not get sawn in half by a wooden saw. Like, that's what that should inspire you for. But he says this. He says, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Meaning, it wasn't just one person that is trusted in the Lord. It wasn't just two people that have trusted in the Lord. Multiple clouds of people. As as There's been so many people quietly and publicly who have trusted in the Lord and God has done many great things. He says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. What do we do when we get into that situation and we're just like, what am I doing married to this dinkelsplat? What do I do? We look to Jesus. Literally. All, that's all we do is we look to Jesus and we trust him. And I'm not saying that that makes it any easier. But you must endure because God is doing powerful things. My brother said this to me when we were moose hunting last year. He said that we see this moose and it was six miles off the lake and we're just about to go out. I didn't want to go after it because I'm getting old and lazy and I just wanted to go home and sleep in my camp. And he's like, Justin, no great story ever ended with, and then I went back to camp. (laughs) I'll tell you what, it'll end as soon as you stop. That's when it for sure ends. Like somebody else can back out of the situation. Other things can happen. But I guarantee you, as soon as you quit, it's over. 
As soon as you quit, it's over. And that's why Paul challenges Timothy. Why, why is he challenging Timothy? Okay. So Timothy is in Ephesus, which is this pagan epicenter uh, of the world. And they have the, the temple of the goddess Diana there. And there's all this worship going on. There's shrines everywhere. And there's struggle going on. And Timothy is young. And, and he's out there and he's kind of facing it on his own. Even if he's not alone, he feels alone. And, and there's all this struggle. And, and he just wants, everybody wants to cut and run at some point. Has anybody in here ever wanted to cut and run from something? Yeah. Something, somewhere, sometime. And let me tell you, when the world is crashing down around you and you're a pastor and you're trying to minister to these people and they got all these problems and now you're getting, now you're getting PTSD from hearing their problems, like you want to cut and run. But Paul says you must. You must endure. Yeah, you can quit, Timothy. Yeah, you can go and become a carpenter. Yeah, you can go and do this. You could go do that. You can go out to sea and go fishing. But God has called you to this and you need to stand your ground. You need to stand your ground. Man, I want to say so much about this. I'm not going to. Mm. You must endure as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4. No one engaged, engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. No one engaged in warfare. So there's two types of life out here. There's the engaged life, And there's the entangled life. You are either fully engaged or you were tangled up. And you think about it. You think about all the things that can tangle us up in this world. You know the old expression, give give somebody enough rope and they'll hang themselves with it? That's that's one of the perils of free will and, and the autonomy that God gives us to such an extent is we have so much rope that Satan utilizes that and he takes us out. He allows us to get tangled up, and that's why he, the author of Hebrews says it right there. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run the race with endurance. There are things, sin especially, that has this tendency of tangling us up, and you're still there. Like You're, you're still looking out, but you're tangled up. Have you ever been tangled up in something or caught up in something or your feet get tangled up? I was talking to somebody the other day and they stepped over a, uh, a gas hose and then their leg went, <laughs> snapped off, basically. Basically. At Fred Meyer. Never go to Fred Meyer. That's what happens at Fred Meyer. Um, but the things that get us tangled up and the reality is our eyes can still see. It's like... Um, so within, within marriage, you think about it, and how many of us want to have a horrible marriage? Does anybody in here just want to be in a horrible marriage? Just by a show of hands, are you excited about, like, you were, when you were a little girl, did you dream about marrying this total oaf that was just a total bummer to be around? And then you look at Fabio over there, and you're like, man, I messed up. <laughs> Fabio. Yeah. But these things come into the marriage, and you're just like, I just need to... I think one of the big ones, right, is pornography. It's kind of an epidemic nowadays. And guys and women are tangled up in it, right? But I think it's like, it's over 80% of guys are tangled up in it at some capacity. And it's, it's like choking the life out of your marriage, and you can still see your wife there, and you're like, all the... You know that oh, the marriage can be amazing, but you're so tangled up in it that you can't get over to that amazing spot. Like, you're so tangled up that you can't, you're just like sitting there like an inchworm crawling across the floor instead of running, right? The author of Hebrews tells us that we need to run this race with endurance, not crawl around and flounder around on the ground trying to get there because we're so tangled up. We need to get rid of these things that are ensnaring us. We need to let them go. And the cool thing is that they don't have to ensnare you. They don't have to ensnare you. God wants to break those bonds. He does. And if we, if we allow God to do it, he does incredible things. And the weight of it, and I think of like unforgiveness, has anybody in here ever been wronged by somebody before? Can you still picture the person that wronged you? Do you hate them? No. Good. But so many of us do. There's still people I don't like. Hate's kind of a strong word. It's the right word, but still strong. But here's what it does. You get bitter about something, and what you do is you plant that seed, and it goes deep down, and then, then, then it grows up into this horrible plant. It's like an alien coming out of your chest. Ah, and you're incapacitated. That's what happens. But this bitterness and unforgiveness, it creeps in, and it absolutely destroys what's going on. 
But God says we can forgive. We can let it go. Because he has forgiven us. It's a perspective issue. And we give it to Jesus. And even though we've been hurt, we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and we just keep running this race. We let it go. But we get entangled with these things. Sometimes we even get entangled with, with the pursuit of money or careers or whatever it is, and we're just pursuing it. We don't have time to serve in the kingdom of God. It's like, man, I would just love to go on that mission trip, but I've gotten myself so lined out that I don't, I'm so tangled up in everything. My hands are tied. I can't go. And we get tied up in all these ropes. They start to ensnare us. And then we're caught up and we become incapacitated. And he says this. He says that, that no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Look, if you're not engaged in warfare, you're getting tangled up by all of these things. And all of a sudden, the rest of the world tells you, this is what your life should look like. And, and you're sitting there and you're like, I'm sitting in a cubicle, punching papers and looking at a computer. And you're like, that's the meaning of life. Life's a blank and then you die. The only two things that are sure about life is death and taxes. And then we become cynical. And we're just like, oh, oh, look at them running around. Must be nice to run around like that. I'm hogtied here on the ground. Like Eeyore. <laughs> oh, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Piglet. God wants to break those bonds. And this is for every one of us to, to do business with the Lord on ourselves. Like, only you can know if you're tangled up. Because I can look at your life, and I'm super judgmental, and I can tell how messed up your lives are, and <laughs> how perfect mine is, and how there's nothing going on in my life, right? But the reality, no, there's, the reality is, is that we all have things that are tangling us up, and tripping us up, and tying our hands, and preventing us from running with the Lord. Do you think about that? Like, do you get the word picture there? Like, running the race with the Lord. Wind in your face, breeze in your hair, like Absalom, long hair flowing in the wind. And you're going through life with excitement. How many of you can still run? Less than half of the congregation can still run. I tried running the other day. I hadn't run since I was 17 playing lacrosse. And we were, I was preaching up in Alaska, and there's this beautiful beach, and Charlotte's like, we should go for a run. It'll be romantic. Let me tell you what, there was nothing romantic about me not being able to feel my groin for a week. I was like, oh! oh. <laughs> Running is definitely of the devil. But <laughs> it's kind of true sometimes. To run, it was so beautiful until my groin started hurting. Like, it was amazing. I'm running, and the, the water is like, the waves are coming in, and there's seashells. And Sally was down by the seashore picking up seashells. And... I'm running along, and it was like this awesome experience, and you just feel alive. But what happens is, is as life comes at you, all of a sudden your groin starts hurting, and you're just like, you know what? I am never going to go for another run again. I could have been doing it wrong. I was kind of running like this. But think about that for a second. What's happening is, is man is breaking down. Before the fall, there was no death, and man is breaking down, and these sins come into our life, and just all the things that tangle us up, and it makes it harder and harder to run to the point where we don't even want to run anymore. And not only do we not want to run anymore, we don't see the point in running anymore, and we're like, I don't even know why anybody else runs, and we become cynical, and we're missing out on the whole thing that, that, that life is this awesome journey with Jesus that we get to run through, and it's just a vapor. It's just a short time, and we might as well run the whole time and see how far we can get in this life building God's kingdom instead of getting tangled up and that is the greatest purpose and he says engage don't get entangled engage don't get entangled and every one of us has that opportunity every single day it does not matter like you may be tangled up and hog tied and hand tied and everything else right now but i'm telling you right now you just take out your knife and you just cut the it's how it works and you can start fresh right this minute like, if there's people that you haven't forgiven, you can literally pull out your phone right now and text them and say, hey, I'd like to meet. Or maybe, maybe it's somebody who's dead and gone, and you need to just, like, get it off your chest and write an email. Like, I write emails all the time, and then I delete them because they would just derail people completely. <laughs> but to get it out there, to confess it, just, let, just talk to people that have hurt you. Maybe there's people that don't even know that they've hurt you that you need to forgive. Maybe there's something going on in your marriage that you need to talk about and it's just driving you crazy, but you haven't talked about it. You just stuffed it down and now it's growing up into bitterness and just hatred and unforgiveness. Like you could change that. 
That's the crazy thing, is it tomorrow does not have to look like today does. That is, do you know how revolutionary that is? Because we get locked in and we're like, yeah, my life has looked like this up to this point and it's going to look like that until I die. I'm going to hate them till I die. Gar. It can change right now. You've got to identify, and this is between you and the Lord, what is tangling you up? What is stopping you from running? And you need to engage it. You need to engage the Lord. You need to answer that call. Take those opportunities when God is saying, hey, look, I've got an opportunity. Have you ever been driving down the road and you see somebody and you're like, man, I should stop and talk to them? Or you're walking through a store and you see somebody and you're like, I don't want to talk to them. Maybe the Lord is asking you to do something there. And he's giving you opportunity and you're passing it by. Engage. Engage, Maverick, right? Engage. That's what we need to do. We are either engaged or we are entangled. And when we get entangled with the affairs of this life, we don't please him who enlisted us as a soldier. We want to please him who enlisted us as a soldier. He says this in verse 5, And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. That's an interesting thing. There are still rules. Like, I'm not talking about legalism rules here. I'm talking about you can't just do whatever you want and get away with it. You know why? Because God loves you too much to let you get away with something that's killing you. That's the truth of the matter. Like, God, God gives you a surprising amount of leeway. In my life, anyway, he's given me a surprising amount of leeway. But at some point, if I don't turn around, God just jerks that chain backwards and you fall on your butt, right? Or for some of us, he might put a shock collar on you and you get out to that boundary and you're like, oh, look, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> and that's what happened. Things just blow apart. And that's God's love. Because in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that God disciplines those that he loves. He jerks the chain back. Why? Because you're about to run off that cliff. And if you keep going and he lets you keep going, man, you're going to just destroy not only your life, but everybody around you. There are rules to how we do this. There's the rule of love that Jesus has given us, of servanthood, uh, and all the right and wrong. Like it's, cra- it's, it's so simple, it shouldn't even have to be explained. But nobody gets crowned unless they compete according to the rules. You can't go through life willy-nilly saying, oh, I can do whatever I want, I can be lawless, I can be licentious, I can rip off people, but at least I go to church on Sunday and I repent for it all. That gives Christianity, Jesus, and all of us a bad name. Not to mention you're going to hell. So there's that. So don't rip anybody off. Compete according to the rules. And then finally, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. He says, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Now, here's what I want to challenge us on. Is to taste the fruit of your life. Taste the fruit of your life. Look at what you've accomplished so far. Look at the relationships around you and and take a taste of them like the hardworking farmer and see if that that fruit is good. Is God pleased with that? Is God pleased with the relationships I have? Is God pleased with the, the way I'm responding to people? Is God pleased with the way that I'm parenting my children? Is God pleased with the way I'm loving my wife as Christ loved the church? Is God pleased with the way I'm being a godly woman who is supporting and encouraging and respecting her husband and building him up? Is God pleased with that? Take a bite of it, taste it, and if it's putrid, spit it out and throw that fruit away and start over today. The hardworking farmer must be first. To taste his crops. It is a wise thing for you to do to sample the fruit of your life and to be really honest with yourself. Remember we looked at Romans chapter 12 a couple of weeks ago and in Romans chapter 12 he says to think of ourselves not more highly than we ought but soberly. I was talking to a guy the other day and he runs uh, to, I was talking to someone the other day and they had a, they ran a trap shooting deal and There was all sorts of different skill levels on the team, and then there was this guy, on the this dad, who wanted his kid to be in the top rung. He wanted his kid to be in the top rung. Even though his kid was like a mid-level or bottom-level shooter, he wanted him to be there, and so he's like trying to crunch the numbers every which way, and like, oh, well, these kids missed some school, or missed some shot shooting this one time, and so that brings their average down since they weren't there. Let's just put a zero there. And it's just like, dude, your son is just bad at shooting trap. And that's okay, like some people are bad at things, but we have to be honest with ourselves because it just makes a mess of absolutely everything when we're totally unrealistic. 
Like, you have to be honest with yourself. Is, are things going bad? Because, do you remember what he says? The fault, dear Brutus, does not lie in our stars, but in ourselves. We often blame everything, including God, for all these things that are going on in our life. But ve- nine times out of ten, the problem in our life is ourself. And we need to allow God, we're always asking for God to work in somebody else's life and to change them and to do all this stuff and make them not such a crook and all this other stuff. What if we started asking the Lord to do stuff in our own life? Because I've noticed when I start getting mad at other people, actually, most of the time, it's something that's going on in my own heart that I need to deal with. I'm not sure I told this story publicly, but the other day, we're walking off the mountain hunting, and it was like 80 degrees, and I'm dying, and I'd been in the front the whole time, and all of a sudden, we get down towards the bottom, and my brother passes me, and he starts walking in front of me, and, but he just didn't walk in front of me, then he's like 50 yards ahead of me, he's like 100 yards ahead of me, then he's like 200 yards ahead of me, and I'm like, the audacity of this arrogant little punk <laughs> with his two legs walking down, he's so, in, he's so in shape, and then I was like, wait a second, I'm getting mad because I'm getting out. I'm just like getting older and slower and he's still fast and I'm frustrated that I'm getting slow and the Lord is just like hitting me. Be honest with yourself. Why are you mad at somebody? Sometimes it's righteous what they're doing. Sometimes you're just a, you're just on the downhill slope in your walker and just struggling. That's the way I am. I'm basically in a walker and it'll be sad to see where I am in another year. Pray for me. Yeah, I know. All right, all right. Let's focus on the Lord. Let's bring it back. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. And I want to pray that over us as I close. Look, we've looked at a lot, like, Jesus is superior to everything, and anything in your life that is built on anything but Jesus is just a total letdown. It's rubbish. It's nothing compared to what you could have. Like, you think a nicer house, a nicer job, a nicer place to live, a better church and better pastor, like, those things are just demonic. And you just, you get into this place, and you need to just, we need to pray. Because here's what I believe is, I could sit up here all day long and try and tell you different ways to engage your life, but so much of it is between you and the Lord, and the work of his Holy Spirit in your life. And so what I want to pray is that the Lord would give you understanding of the things that you face in your life so you can deal with them. Nobody needs to tell you how to deal with them. The Lord will speak to you and give you understanding. So let's pray that together and let's worship the Lord. Lord, I pray that you would give my friends just incredible understanding of the word that we've read here today, the word that we've listened to today, Lord. Give them understanding and I pray that you would help them to apply it to their lives, Lord. I pray that you would just bring to their attention things in their life that are preventing them from running well with you. Lord, I pray that you would just show them that and that you would liberate them from that and that you would allow them to just run with endurance and and in an amazing way, Lord. And I pray that you would do incredible things through their life, Lord, that they thought might have been past happening. Lord, I pray, as your word says in Philippians chapter 4, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so, Lord, I pray that those great exploits that you have for my friends, I pray that you would help them to carry them out and empower them by your Holy Spirit. Encourage them, Lord, and I pray that you just give them focus and strength as they go back out of this building and engage the life that you have given them and blessed them with. I pray this in Jesus' name.